Uh, now is the time to give the floor uh, to Jason Seo uh, from Arizona State University, who will chair the digital session. Okay, yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Let's move on to um, some short talks from now, and I'm going to moderate two digital talks. So the first talk will be given by Professor Steve Berber. Um, he's an ICL professor of computer engineering at University of Manchester. So Steve, please carry on. Okay. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm here to speak about the Spinnaker Neuromorphic Computing Platform. Um, Spinnaker is a compression of spiking neural network architecture, and it's a machine that my group has been building and developing for the last 20 years. So if we look at our original objectives, um, the plan was to put a million ARM processors, those are small processors you find in embedded systems and mobile phones, and put a million of those into a machine so that they could be connected to support real-time models of the spiking networks that are found in the brain. Uh, from the outset, it was clear that even with a million processors, you don't get near the scale of the human brain. Uh, then we thought we might get to about 1% of that scale, or as I prefer to think of it, 10 whole mice. Uh, even that now turns out to be a bit optimistic, and you could probably do a whole mouse brain on the million core Spinnaker machine. So the principles of the machine are that it's uh, developed as a 2D mesh, uh, where each node in the mesh has a compute chip, which is the Spinnaker chip designed by my group in Manchester, and a standard memory chip. And with that node, we can then tile an almost arbitrary 2D surface. So the work started with the design of the Spinnaker chip itself. And this is packaged with the memory chip as shown at the top left of this slide. The dark gray area is the memory chip and the lighter squarer die underneath is the compute layer. And these are gold, gold wire bonded together inside the package, which is about two centimeters by two centimeters and can be used as a component. Uh, so with that package with the two chips in, we can tile a 2D surface and we uh, use that chip to populate the printed circuit board shown here, which has 48 of those chips on. Each chip has 18 ARM cores, so that's 864 cores on that circuit board. And then those circuit boards can be assembled into larger machines. And the picture here shows the million core machine that was uh, launched in Manchester in November 2018 and has been supporting the 24 7 neuromorphic computing service ever since under the auspices of the European Union Human Brain Project. Uh, we actually launched the service uh, two and a half years earlier with a half a million core machine and, and then expanded it to the four million cores in November 2018. And we have something like 450 remote users of the machine and we've run several million jobs in the time the service has been operating. If we uh, look at the key feature of the machine, in many ways, it looks like a fairly conventional, massively parallel computer, but it's the way that we connect the processors together that's unique. When a neuron, which is modeled in software on a processor, emits a spike, that spike is represented as a packet that's passed through a packet switch network, which to achieve the connectivity found in biology has to be a multicast. Um, routing mechanism. So each packet contains 32 bits, which represents the neuron that spiked in a, an address event representation format, and eight bits of header. The packet can carry a data payload, but typical spike packets have no payload. And then each chip has at its heart a router uh, that looks at the key and decides uh, which uh, of its local 18 processors uh, that packet should be forwarded to and which of its six adjacent chips. And it can be forwarded to any or all of those 24 destinations. And so that allows us to build almost arbitrary tree structures across the machine where particular neural packets can follow that tree structure to be sent to a thousand destinations um, at one go. And that allows us to build networks which match biological um, complexity. Of course, our users don't want to understand the fine details of the routing or the mapping onto cores. And so there's a software stack which starts from the Pine language, which is widely used, 
you can run Pine programs on your laptop or on the other neuromorphic platform in the Human Brain Project, which is called BrainScales. Um, but with Spinnaker, this software stack maps it onto the machine and sends your results back. The big machine in Manchester is not the only Spinnaker machine. There are about 100 boards out uh, with research groups all around the world. And what can the machine do? Well, it was built primarily for brain modeling. And here's an example of that, the cortical microcircuit. Uh, Yulia referred to this. Um, it's quite a complex circuit. And the square millimeter model has been run on Spinnaker and on high performance computers and GPU systems. And Spinnaker was the first platform to achieve biological real time, although we've had a kind of informal competition and now the other platforms are also running at real time. We're in the process of scaling this up to 100 square millimeters. And with Spinnaker, all we do is allocate 100 times more computing resource for the larger model. So we uh, anticipate uh, continuing to run at real time. Now, this cortical microcircuit is very interesting because it's the grounds of quite a lot of the high level functions in the brain. And we can model it and we can reproduce biological data, but we still don't understand it. We developed a, a second generation Spinnaker chip, again within the Human Brain Project, with roughly 10x the processing capability and 10x the energy efficiency. And this is being used as the basis of larger machines currently under construction at TU Dresden, who, with whom we collaborated in the design and uh, ourselves. And the, we've introduced a lot of low power techniques to optimize Spinnaker 2. Uh, so we have dynamic power management on each of the 152 processors. Each one can set its voltage and frequency, optimized for its workload in the next time step, whatever that what might be. Um, we've increased the memory sharing because we find that's more useful than we thought it would be when we designed Spinnaker 1. We've added support for conventional machine learning in the form of a multiply accumulate accelerator. Um, we have neuromorphic accelerators, network on chip, um, and low level uh, silicon optimization technologies. And if you wish to know more about the Spinnaker project, um, we published a book a couple of years ago, which describes the origins and development of Spinnaker One and the many applications, biological and, and more applied, that run on it. And this is available open access as PDF to download, or you can pay money for a paper copy if you wish to. And with that, I think I'll finish. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, um, for the nice talk. Um, we have time for maybe, yeah, one question. I think um, there was one question on the q and I think it's a more general question, but still it could be applicable um, for you. So, I mean, you mentioned a couple of initial, you know, applications of target for Spinnaker, but do you see Spinnaker? I mean, there are some, you know, good applications that, you know, could tar Spinnaker could target on the edge, for example. So could you comment on several possible applications that Spinnaker could be suitable or fitting for? Yes, I mean, Spinnaker is basically a, a general purpose platform. The neural models and the learning rules are all in software, so it's quite flexible. Um, <clears throat> and if you if you survey the Spinnaker papers, of which there are uh, several hundred now, I think, you'll see it's been applied to things such as, as keyword recognition, robot control, as well as the biological applications, which were really the uh, what we originally conceived the machine to address. So most of the biological areas, again, that Yulia mentioned, such as cerebellum, basal ganglia, have been modeled on Spinnaker, but engineering applications are of growing interest as well. Okay, thank you. So yeah, let's wrap that up. Thank you very much, Steve, for your first talk. And then let's move on to the second short talk by Charlotte Frankel. So Charlotte, is a assistant professor um, at Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. And she'll talk about some digital lesson and accelerators. Charlotte. Thank you, Jason, for the introduction. So indeed, in this presentation, we'll talk about how digital spiking neural network accelerators enable pneumorphic, in, uh, pneumorphic edge intelligence. Um, so let's start with the boiling question in the field, uh, which is which, techno which design methodology should be chosen for neuromorphic engineering? And there are two main ones. Um, actually, the most common one is to start from neuroscience observation and then to replicate this observation into neuromorphic processors, typically at the level of biophysically detailed neuron and synapse models. 
and then to apply those resources to real world applications. So this is typically a bottom up design flow, which leads to experimentation platforms uh, whose goal is to uh, efficiently emulate or simulate the neuroscience primitives. So we have seen uh, great examples of that with uh, Spinnaker and Loihi, which are uh, which are the large scale type, large scale experimentation platforms. But there also exists small small scale um, experimentation platforms. For example, here is the Odin pneumorphic processor, which is fully open source and digital, and uh, it embeds a quite large feature set. So with all synapses embed uh, spike a form of spike time independent plasticity. So we will have uh, more about this in a later talk. Um, and the neurons embed the 20 main Isakiewicz behaviors. So these are the 20 main spiking behaviors of cortical neurons. And time constants can go from biological to accelerated. And so how to implement this large uh, feature set efficiently? Actually, there are three main points. The first one is to use time multiplexing. So you use only one copy of uh, the neuron and synapse update logic. You do not replicate all of them in parallel. This saves a lot of resources and you store the neuron and synapse states in centralized memories, as you can see here in the chip microphotograph. So the second point is uh, to aim for full space and time locality, because that saves a lot of memory overhead. And therefore, that means that you have to select wisely the neuron and the synapse models that you implement. And still about the neuron and synapse models, uh, do not implement partial differential equation solvers. This takes a lot of resources. Actually, the brain itself is not bit precise, and it's completely fine if you replicate these behaviors at a more qualitative level, which is known as phenomenological modeling. And so by following these three guidelines, uh, we can demonstrate with Odin a record density and also the lowest energy per synaptic operation among digital designs uh, at the time of publication, because now these designs are more uh, about two to five picojoules per synaptic operation that gives you uh, an ID. Actually, we'll release soon uh, a newer version of Odin that goes along this, uh, this range of uh, efficiency. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that this is competitive with mixed signal designs. So mixed signal designs typically uh, achieve the best efficiency at the neuron level. So these numbers in terms of picojoules per synaptic operation, they can be 10 to even 100 times lower for mixed signal designs. But at the system level, as soon as you take into account the cost of communication, you go back to the picojoule level. So the fully digital systems are competitive. So this was for the bottom-up design approach, uh, but the problem with purely bottom-up approaches, and this was a, a question discussed a bit earlier, what is the guidance for exploration? It's a bit hard to see how to efficiently deploy these neuron and synapse resources at a large scale more efficiently than conventional engineering approaches, um, so typically deep neural network accelerators. So actually another way to go, and I'm coming here to the second methodology, it to, is to start from the real-world application that you're targeting, then to implement pneumorphic processors that solve this application while taking into account some insight from neuroscience. But then the challenge lies here. Which uh, type of neuroscience primitives should you take into account to achieve your, your competitive advantage? So this is now a top-down design approach leading to the design of pneumorphic accelerators. And the goal now is to optimize between energy and accuracy on a given task. So for the top-down side, because the real-world application is now the starting point, Let's start with the real world application that we have selected. And let's uh, select here on device learning, which is a quite hot topic in TinyML at the moment with a recent event that was focused specifically on that. And we have that one specific flavor of on device learning is actually still an open challenge. Um, it is having it end to end, so fully on chip without external memory and on temporal data. Because on temporal data, you have to use backprop through time. And backprop through time works on uh, an enrolled version of the network where you have to keep in memory all the network states. So I mentioned earlier that space and time locality are everything. And backprop through time is everything but local in space and time. So that's a hint. Obviously, the brain doesn't do that. And so we can look a little bit better at some other types of algorithms, which may be more bioplausible. And among forward mode learning algorithms, uh, we have LGBT propagation, or EPROP for short, which was proposed recently in this paper. And what EPROP does is that it approximates a backprop through time gradients as a product of two terms, one that is error dependent and available locally in time, and one that is computed exclusively forward in time. These are the eligibility traces that are shown here, and that are not error dependent, but they form a trace of the network activity over time and compute it only forward in time. So actually going from backprop through time to the type of algorithms on the right, we have that biological plausibility goes up, especially as these eligibility traces are supported by biological evidence. So this is the bottom-up insight. 
uh, space and time locality goes up. We only need to buffer the current time step. And therefore, that the on-chip memory requirements are slashed due to this space and time locality. So we can implement the EPROP learning algorithm on the chip, and here would be the results. So this is actually the REC neuromorphic processor, which is also fully open source. So it uh, takes less than half a millimeter squared of, si of silicon area, and it does not have any external memory. So it's fully end-to-end -end temporal on-chip learning. So here is the big picture. So uh, Recon embeds a spiking Recon neural network, and which connects to any kind of spiking sensor. So this can be a spiking retina, pneumorphic cochlea. As long as the sensor talks with spike, this is all that the device needs to know. And this points to another advantage of spikes, which allow not only for event-driven sparsity aware computation, but also for sensor agnostic raw data processing, which leads to task agnostic processing and learning. Um, so to give you an idea of task agnostic processing and learning, we can select different benchmarks, one on vision with gesture classification, one on audition with uh, a keyword spotting with a spiking uh, cochlea, and a navigation task, which is typical of neuroscience-oriented experiments. Uh, and we have that from scratch, Recon has learned to perform these tasks with good accuracy for all of them, while always maintaining a power budget that is below 50 microwatts, including learning. So this is typically a power budget that is suitable for uh, extreme edge computing. So to summarize, uh, we have seen that digital pneumorphic chips offer an excellent trade-off between robustness, flexibility, scalability, scalability, design time, and efficiency. Uh, we have seen that bottom-up approach is best suited for the design of pneumorphic experimentation platforms, while a top-down design approach is preferred to demonstrate the competitive advantage in real-world applications. We have also seen that top-down approaches need bottom-up insight where neuromorphic intelligence, and for example, in, this, in the specific case of Recon, these were the eligibility traces. And we have seen that digital neuromorphic computing supports end-to-end -end temporal on-device learning with extreme edge power budgets of less than 50 microwatts. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, there's one by Paul. The question is, why full space and time locality does not contradict with time multiplexing? To time multiplex, you need to separate the processing element from its memory? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, so by um, full space and time locality, I usually mention the algorithmic uh, point. So the algorithm needs to be fully local in space and time. And then how you compute your time step. So let's say everything, uh, everything takes place in one time step. How you compute this time step is another question. So here we go on the implementation side. Uh, and indeed, uh, that's where we have to leave uh, a purely biologically plausible approach for the sake of efficiency. So we leave science for engineering. And actually, the only reasonable way to uh, to implement large neuron and synapses, uh, large neuron and synapse resources on a chip, on a digital chip, is to leverage time multiplexing because that makes it affordable from a silicon silicon area point of view. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, one more question from Fabrizio. Um, do you think that all the advantages of digital design that you mentioned will still be true with non-CMOS, like RM, analog neuromorphic chips being probably available in the future? That's a good question too. The, the thing I'm convinced of is that to, to demonstrate a quick proof of concept that is still reasonably efficient, uh, digital is excellent to do so. And once the first proof of concept is done, then you can you know, further improve efficiency. You can go for uh, indeed these emerging memory devices, uh, which I believe promise further efficiency uh, and even features and emulation improvement. Uh, so indeed, uh, I'm going for the digital approach for the for the proof of concept, and then for optimization, everything is still open. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to thank all of the speakers for providing such a clear and interactive overview of the field, the Technical Program Committee for putting this program together, and of course you for attending this event. So if you'd like to go beyond today's talks, uh, you will find it to, to the, in the download section of this event's website, a PDF file that contains one page summaries of all the talks that you have seen today. And these also contain some useful references to go further. This is the list of our strategic partners. Uh, starting with the executive ones, ARM, Edge uh, Impulse, Qualcomm, uh, Sintiant, and we have Deployed as a Platinum sponsor, Clickatech, Platinum, Reality AI, Renaissance, Sony. Uh, gold sponsors are uh, Analog Devices, Photo Hub, uh, Microsoft, 
NXP, Seed Studio, um, ZML, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, Synsense, um, we presented today. And we have uh, several strategic uh, silver strategic partners here. And just at the end, um, um, if you, you can go to tinyml.org website and you're going to see a lot of events happening in, in this fall and in the next six months. Again, thank you again and uh, we'll stay in touch.